My name is Naomi Cameron. I'm a professor and chair of the Department of Mathematics at Spelman College. And it's my pleasure to introduce um, our speaker for the MA invited address this morning, Dr. Fern Hunt. Dr. Hunt received her degree in mathematics, her undergraduate degree in mathematics from Bryn Mawr College, and her MS and PhD from the Courant Institute of Mathematics. From Courant, Dr. Hunt went on to a successful career in academia, beginning um, at the University of Utah and continuing, continuing for many years at Howard University, my alma mater. Uh, Dr. Hunt is one of the few mathematicians I know who has managed to have a productive and impactful career not only in academia but also in industry. She began her career at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, uh, in 1993, and she continues um, there as an emeritus scientist uh, to this day. She has worked in the Computing and Applied Mathematics, uh, math, uh, mathematics Laboratory at NIST, where she has focused in applied probability theory and dynamical systems, as well as biomathematics. Uh, she is uh, one of the most productive scholars um, that I know of. She is um, the author of many articles, recipient of many research grants, and has given countless talks and presentations. Um, what I find so impressive about her career and the reason that I look up to her so much is because not only has she been uh, such a productive scholar both in academia and industry, but she's been an active leader and role model in the scientific community. Um, she's worked on so many committees and important advisory roles for a variety of organizations and professional societies. Um, I'm happy to say she's been recognized for her outstanding contr contributions to the field with numerous awards. Um, in 2000, she received the Arthur S. Fleming Award for Outstanding Federal Service. In 2005, she was the AWM MAA Etta Zuber Falconer Lecturer. And in 2019, she was named a 2020 Fellow of the AWM. Uh, she's also been featured in a recent Springer volume um, titled 50 Years of Women in Mathematics as part of the AWM Mathematics Series. Just a quick cursory search on the web will show you that um, she's also the subject of a variety of publications, websites, and archives. I encourage you in your spare time to Google her and look at some of her um, interviews. She shares lots of great advice and wisdom, um, one of which is about the beauty of mathematics and um, how we can find that in our everyday lives. And she's also talked about how she's benefited from the support and friendship of African-American women mathematicians who preceded her and have come onto the scene since. And that wisdom certainly resonates with me as a black woman mathematician. Um, unfortunately, the universe de denied me <laughs> the pleasure of being in one of her classes at Howard. We sort of missed each other like ships passing in the night which is why it's such an honor for me to, to introduce her today, to give this um, MAA invited address titled, A Markov Chain Approach to Finding Effective Spreaders in a Network. So without further ado, Dr. Hunt. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Professor Cameron, for um, for that great introduction. And I'd also like to thank the organizers and the leadership of the MAA for inviting me this year to this year's Math Fest. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to be talking about um, some work that I've done um, that results from uh, my interest in Markov chains and Markov chain dynamics, particularly paths and their first return uh, properties and the related first entrance time, which I'll talk about also today. Um, these ideas are applied to a project um, in network science, and so I'll start by giving you my definition of network science. Um, network science is a discipline that attempts to uh, study networks, which of course appear everywhere now in modern life, and the, um, 
the important, it uses essentially mathematics as a means to describe, analyze, to control, to prescribe policies for networks. And since um, network science uses mathematics, the network graph is, the, um, is essentially the object of study. Um, network graph is a mathematical graph, and um, as you recall, a graph is essentially, um, is consists of a finite set of points known as nodes or vertices, and these represent agents in the network, and the relationships between these agents is represented as an edge between uh, two nodes. And those nodes have a sort of a neighboring relation, therefore, to each other. Uh, and we can represent an edge by an ordered pair of nodes. The objects of study are actual networks, which can vary from uh, uh, millions of agents, as in a social network, or we can be talking about biological uh, networks where the agents uh, are represented as nodes um, that represent biological organisms, for example, or they may represent genes and proteins. And then uh, much small, on a much smaller scale, but very important, utility networks for water and electricity. What are the questions of network science? Well, an important question is control. That is, given the graph structure, um, can this network be controlled? And if so, uh, what are the agents that control it? Um, if we have uh, controlling nodes in the network graph, can we minimize the number of uh, controlling or driver nodes? Um, another related question to control is, um, is, is uh, robustness. So for example, if a network experiences some interruption, um, can normal operations in some way continue despite that interruption? A second important question in networks is communication. So here we're looking at the dynamics of spread, computer viruses or biological viruses or organ, uh, uh, bacteria that cause disease. And uh, in this, in this, in this uh, connection then, uh, uh, how, how quickly, given the network graph, will these diseases spread? Um, we can extend those ideas of spread to social networks as well. Uh, so we can study the spread of rumors, opinions, and of innovation as well. Um, one question in communication that's important is, uh, can we identify uh, the nodes that will facilitate the fastest spread? of information in a network, or con uh, conversely, is there a way of identifying nodes that will, in fact, inhibit spread, if it's something that we don't want to spread? The tools are the tools of mathematics, and uh, graph theory is used, spectral theory, uh, discrete optimization, discrete mathematics, operations research, and probability. I'm going to focus on um, uh, communication in networks, and in particular, uh, the kind of communication that can be profitably uh, modeled by random walk in the, net, in the network graph, where you're at a node and you move to neighboring nodes. This has been successful in the past in modeling communication in networks where you have a limited amount of energy, where you cannot um, uh, you don't have a lot of en energy to, to, uh, to invest in the communication process. And a kind of a loose and informal example of that is suppose I'm in a room with a lot of people. It could be a classroom, it could be a reception, it could be a lecture hall, and suppose I, there is something that I have to tell every individual there, but I don't have enough energy you know, to go to each person. But I do know something about the uh, pattern of communication among the individuals. So then the question is, given that information, can I identify some subset? So if there are 35 people in the room, can I find the four people, if I, if I can only use four people, can I identify the four individuals that will facilitate the spread of my message to the rest of the individuals? 
to, to talk about that I, in more detail, uh, I'll uh, define what I mean by a random walk in the network graph. So uh, imagine then that we have a random walker who is situated at uh, somewhere in the graph at a vertex i. And then uh, that, uh, that individual then selects among the neighboring nodes, that is to say the other nodes uh, that i is connected through, through edges. And uh, moving to such a neighbor, let's look at the total number of, of such vertices, and that is called the degree of the vertex i. So in a random walk, uh, an individual uh, situated at i will pick a neighbor at random with probability, a one over the degree of i, and then will move to that neighbor j. And the probability is called p uh, i j. Since p i j is a, is a probability, we know that is, it is non-negative. Uh, and, um, and in particular, if I were to sum, over all of the vertices, starting, say I started I and I sum over possible vertices J uh, through, the, uh, uh, through the network, then the sum of the PIJs is equal to one, which means that if we collect PIJ into uh, a matrix, call it P, that gives us the uh, matrix that is the transition probability matrix of a Markov chain. And that allows us to use some of the properties of the Markov chain and even more so some specialized properties uh, to, to analyze uh, that random walk. From the point of view of communication, you're moving, you're, you're st at a, a vertex i and you move to j, that um, it means essentially uh, that we, there is a message at j at um, vertex j, and that moves to vertex i. So the direction of the random walk, let's see, the, can you hear me? Okay. The, uh, the direct, uh, this is, is that showing up? No. All right. The direction of the random walk from I to J is the opposite to the direction of, met of the uh, communication of information. It goes from J to I. Um, in order to measure the time it takes, oh, in fact, let me just uh, say one thing before I talk about uh, uh, mean first entrance time. If we're interested in effective spreaders, Right in my informal example, For, say there's a vertex J that is very effective at spreading uh, a message. Then, from a random walk point of view, that means that J that uh, vertices um, get to J very quickly. In other words, it's a very um, effective target of random uh, of the random walk. Effective in the sense of uh, it takes a short amount of time. And that uh, leads, therefore, to uh, talking about how long it takes. And suppose we have a target vertex. As we see in this graph here, it's colored yellow. And um, we, we, of course, don't have to consider a single vertex as a target. We could consider sets. But just to start, um, let's define um, H i j, which is in the uh, right-hand corner there, uh, to be the average or mean number of steps it takes a random walker starting at i to, uh, to, to arrive at the vertex j, all right? And the, we use mean or average because we have a random walk, and so the walker is free to use an indirect path uh, to j. Uh, what I've written, uh, what we've written below, are a series uh, of recursive rec uh, uh, equations that allow us to find the mean number of steps uh, starting at a vertex uh, that's not four, and uh, how long we measure how long it's going to be able to uh, before it arrives at uh, vertex four uh, for the first time. And what we see from this, say, for example, we take vertex two. Uh, to, uh, and I, 
in uh, Vertex 2, which has neighbors 1 and 3. And I take 2 rather than 1 because I think it illustrates the main point. So uh, first of all, 2 is, uh, if you're at 2, you take one step. And imagine that the, the and in fact, as has to be in this example, you're going to be taking a, a step to neighbor 1 or 3. Both of those, of course, are outside of 4. If I take a step from 2 to 1 with probability p12, then I can get the contribution to the number of steps um, for vertex 2 by multiplying p12 by the number of steps starting at 2 it will take to go to 4. And in a similar way, if uh, I look at three, 3, which is a neighbor of 2, and imagine that I take a random step to 2 with probability two, p2, 3, then the contribution to the mean number of steps starting at 2 will be p2, 3 times the number of steps, mean number of steps starting at 3, it would take to go to 4. And so each one of the equations for the vertices 1, 2, 3, and 5 are gotten that way. In general, if I have an arbitrary subset of the uh, V, set of all vertices, then um, the linear equation for the vector H can be written in a similar fashion to the previous slide. H I A is still the probability of starting in I and uh, entering the uh, set A for the first time. And um, the um, H uh, is equal to a vector of ones, as we saw in the previous slide, plus the probability matrix uh, multiplying by H. In this instance, P twiddle A is a matrix that's describing the transitions from a given vertex, let's say I, to the neighboring vertex vertices that are still outside of the target set A. So it's describing transitions outside of A um, and, uh, and then multi multiplying by the mean number of steps um, needed um, starting at these neighboring vertices. So, uh, if we were to take the sum of all of the um, elements of the vector H and average them, this gives us an average mean first entrance time to approach the target set A. And um, in this way, we can sort of characterize sets, subsets A, which are, on the one hand, good targets for the random walk, and on the other hand, good spreaders in the sense of this uniform random walk. That, um, therefore, is an argument for looking at um, the following um, optimization problem. Suppose now I look at all candidate card target sets that have the same cardinality. Then, um, among all of them, amongst all of them, which one has the smallest value of f? And that is, uh, we, we would argue that is uh, the most effective spreader among all sets of that cardinality. So here I've written that down where the cardinality is k. And this gives us uh, a discrete optimization problem. Uh, and this problem was introduced by Borker and coworkers in 2010. And since I was interested in first entrance times, this looked like a, a very interesting problem. So um, how to solve that problem? Well, if n is the number of vertices, we would like, um, uh, we would like a, a sort of a practical way uh, of being able to solve it. Uh, and that essentially would mean um, a polynomial in, uh, in n uh, amount of time in order to do that. Um, unfortunately, other than exhaustive search, and by exhaustive search I mean you essentially enumerate all of the sets of a given cardinality, k, and then go ahead and solve the linear equation needed to evaluate f of any of, of, of that particular set, and then look and find the uh, minimal value. So other than doing that, um, 
there, uh, is, it's not known to us uh, anything that works faster than that sort of brute force search. So um, lowering standards a little bit, uh, suppose we ask the question, uh, well, uh, I have an algorithm and it produces a, a, a solution of some kind. Um, what I'd like to be able to do is evaluate how good that solution is, maybe compare it to the actual optimal solution of the problem. Um, how good is my offered solution? Here is an example. Suppose we have, we, we apply the greedy algorithm. The greedy algorithm um, is an algorithm that starts with one element sets. Starting with one element sets, we evaluate F for those one element sets, and then we find the one element set that uh, is optimal. For the next stage, let's say uh, we want to find a two element set candidate. To do that, rather than looking at all two element sets, we're going to just confine our search to two element sets that contain the one element set. Having found the best two element set in that sense, I then proceed to three element sets and continue st in that stepwise fact uh, fashion until I reach a set of cardinality K. And that is my offered solution to the, uh, to, to the optimization problem. And now the question arises, well, how good is that, is, is, is that solution? Um, well, fortunately, um, in 1978, Nemhauser, Wolsey, and Fisher actually discussed a very general problem, the problem of maximizing a submodular, a submodular is uh, minus supermodular, uh, submodular um, uh, problem, uh, excuse me, uh, submodular function f, and they proved that, um, in fact, uh, if you uh, consider the offered solution uh, for the greedy algorithm, it's actually pretty good. Uh, namely, uh, it is within 1 minus 1 over e of optimal. So if you, to, to explain what that means, uh, suppose I take the optimal solution to that problem and list it as number one, and then go down around 67%, 1 minus 1 over e, uh, and th that essentially is the ranking of the uh, solution of the greedy algorithm, offered solution. So um, modifying that uh, result, I showed that if f is a supermodular, the offered solution uh, from the greedy algorithm is within 1 minus 1 over e of optimal. Um, and here is the definition of sub, uh, supermodular. I don't have time to really dis, um, discuss this in detail. It uh, essentially has to do with uh, taking a set function uh, taking a set, adding a single element, and describing the difference between, these, um, between the value of the augmented set and the value of the original set, and there's a diminishing returns, um, um, of, of, there's a diminishing returns property for supermodular functions. That's expressed by that inequality. In any event, Borker showed in uh, 2010, also showed that f is supermodular, and that was, uh, and therefore, uh, the statement of the result that I showed earlier uh, follows from Nemhauser et al. I now want to discuss an extension of that, of the, of the greedy approach. Um, the greedy approach had a starter set, didn't it? Namely, the best one element set. And then there was a stepwise greedy extension to find the solution of the best k element set. So what we propose is to use a somewhat more flexible uh, starter set that consists of optimal and near optimal sets of smaller cardinality. And um, now the cost is that, like the original greedy algorithm, it's going to require um, the exact calculation 
of f for those small sets. Nevertheless, the gain would be uh, that we would be able to, as you'll see in the example, find optimal sets that the um, classical greedy algorithm could not find. We can also, in addition, prove mathematically that we are guaranteed to do better than the greedy algorithm and when uh, something called the curvature of, that, of the, of the um, supermodular function, in particular R function, is known, uh, then we can actually quantify the degree of improvement. Well, before going any further, let me just talk about what I mean by optimal and near-optimal sets. Here you see two graphs. Uh, and uh, in the two graphs you'll see, in each of them you'll see some yellow uh, nodes. Those yellow nodes are um, elements of something called a vertex cover. A vertex cover is a subset of nodes that have the property that every edge uh, contains a node of that set. This therefore means, by the way, that if A is a vertex cover, if I start outside of that set A, and uh, in this particular uh, random walk, uh, without a, a, a loss uh, of generality, I'm going to assume that I cannot, I cannot stay at, the, uh, at a vertex. So I have to move to a neighbor. But with that uh, restriction, that means that the mean number of steps to A must be one. Well, since uh, H of I is one, on the other hand, H of I is at least one, as we saw from that linear equation, that means that A is minimal, has a minimal value of F for its cardinality. So a vertex cover is an optimal set. And there's more that can be said. Namely, let's suppose I have a vertex cover and now I add an arbitrary element. Um, I now have a new set, augmented set, that is also optimal for its, uh, for its cardinality. So in other words, once you've reached the vertex cover, you have an optimal set, and you can produce optimal sets of any larger cardinality from that. That means the problem is solved once you have a vertex cover. So we're going to restrict ourselves to cardinalities once we have a vertex cover, and it turns out to be very easy. It turns out to be very easy to do so, uh, to, to, to produce a vertex cover from a graph. In any event, uh, the, um, uh, uh, given a vertex cover, we then just look at the problem for cardinalities that are smaller than the vertex cover. And in addition to that, we also use that vertex cover as a basis for evaluating the degree of optimality, optimality of any uh, subset with smaller cardinality. In other words, we have a way of being able to rank, uh, to, be, to be able to rank subsets uh, smaller, let's say if C is the cardinality of the vertex cover, uh, sets of, uh, subsets of uh, cardinality less than C. Namely, let's suppose we uh, now rank uh, A set. A, uh, uh, with the following, we'll take uh, F max, where F max is essentially the largest possible value of F among subsets of cardinality less than C. Minus F of A divided by uh, F max minus F min. F min is the minimum uh, possible value of F, and we take that to be F, uh, the, the, the value of the, the uh, vertex cover. So uh, this allows us, since we can rank these subsets of cardinality less than A, we can therefore uh, assign a degree of quality. Why? Well, if, F ma if, if a set ha is F max, which is essentially the worst one element set, it has a rank of zero. So if F A is equal to F max, its rank is zero. On the other hand, 
if, um, if A uh, is the best set, um, then uh, F of A is equal to F min, and so it gets a rank of 1. So we have a number that is, um, has some value between 0 and 1, okay? And so, uh, so that means, therefore, if we have some new that's between 0 and 1, this gives us a sense of what its rank would be. Uh, that didn't, OK, you can see it there. Whatever. OK. Um, so what does that mean? Well, we can talk about something called near optimal. Let uh, L of, of nu and C be subsets now whose value, R, uh, rho of A, is at least nu. Again, we're looking at sets of cardinality less than or equal to C, this vertex cover. And given that, then, this notion of near optimal sets, we're going to let M now be the cardinality of the smallest set uh, in L, a new C. Notice there's a tension now between M and nu. If I make nu uh, high, a large, so I'm looking for high quality sets, that means that uh, the card minimum cardinality um, would s start to rise, and that means if it's going to be part of a starter set, I then have to evaluate uh, its F value. And for larger cardinality sets, that's harder. On the other hand, if I lower nu, uh, if I use a lower quality uh, uh, a nu, then that means I'm looking at smaller, m is going to be smaller, it'll be easier to evaluate. So essentially, there is a trade-off between the quality of the near optimal set and the cardinality, uh, the smallest cardinality, m. But that, that is part of the process of deciding what your starter set is going to be. So the algorithm that I'm proposing is to create a starter set um, that's based on the set of near optimal, a collection of near optimal sets uh, based on a quality nu. And these sets are going to have minimal cardinality. Uh, once the, uh, they, their f values are evaluated, then there's no further um, computation um, of, uh, uh, of f, uh, the objective function, it's called here, uh, after that. It's simply a matter of greedily add adding new elements uh, uh, in s uh, and until uh, you reach cardinality k. Once you've reached cardinality k, then you, uh, you then, uh, find the set with the smallest value of f, um, uh, and, and that gives you the uh, uh, offered approximation uh, to the um, uh, optimal set. Um, the brute force uh, calculations occur, so to speak, at the smallest cardinality rather than all, uh, all the way through. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. And this uh, comes from a study of complex networks by uh, Dao Bing and et al. Um, and I have the reference there. It's a graph of 23 nodes. And um, this uh, graph has a vertex cover with 12 elements. And um, I, I took a, a new value of a half, 0.5. Uh, and Having taken that value, it turns out that the minimum uh, cardinality, that is little m, is equal to 1. In other words, the smallest cardinality that uh, uh, near optimal sets have uh, cardinality uh, are, 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 are one element sets. And there are 15 of these uh, elements, and so you calculate the f values, and then uh, greedily extend these values uh, uh, until you reach the desired uh, value of k. And in the next chart, you're going to see, um, in the next slide, you'll see a chart, a table, that uh, shows the results of the computation um, 
as you'll see here, um, uh, at the very top uh, row, uh, you have values of k, and you'll notice that we go only uh, up until uh, 9 rather than up, to, uh, up until 12, which is the uh, cardinality of the vertex cover, and I'll explain why in a, uh, in a minute. The elements of the vertex cover are uh, in the left. Um, and there, I use numbers 1 to 23 to identify the nodes. For um, the, 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 next, the other thing to notice, or the next thing to notice, is that the optimal sets are uh, pictured in red. And um, if, you, if you look there, you'll see um, that the greedy algorithm starts with the best one element, 23. Uh, uh, the, and then it goes on to the best uh, two element and three element. But notice that when you get to k equal four, that the greedy solution is not the best, is not the optimal solution. And in fact, that is the greedy extension of a non-optimal, but a near optimal um, one element set 17. Um, the uh, other thing to notice is, in the case of the greedy algorithm, starting at k, uh, k equal 9, that the optimal set there, um, uh, essentially, interestingly, um, uh, has many of the elements of the vertex cover. Um, but the, uh, but uh, it, that's a side argument. But uh, for k equal 10, 11, and 12, the greedy extension of the nine element set of the, uh, it, in fact, they are all optimal. And then the last comment is that um, many of the optimal sets are subsets of the vertex cover. And at one point, I thought that optimal sets uh, were going to be, um, in fact, uh, in general, subsets of the vertex cover. But that isn't true. If you look at k equal 4, you'll see that um, you'll have a four-element set but that's optimal, but 17, uh, the vertex 17, is not uh, a member of this vertex cover. Uh, in, let me just turn here. The second example of this method is uh, for a computer network. Here the nodes are routers. These are routers throughout um, the United States. Um, and um, for, um, uh, there are 218 uh, vertices, and the vertex cover has 41 nodes. Um, and so we're going to apply the method here. Our starter set, we're going to do two uh, near optimal collections. For the collection new equals seven eighths, the smallest uh, set, the sets of smallest cardinality are one. So we start with singletons and extend greedily in that way. Uh, the second collection is for a larger value of new, and for that larger value of new, 0.93, the smallest cardinality is two. So I have to start with two element sets and then compute. Um, uh, uh, F values there. And I'm going to show you in this graph the results of the comparison of the method used on the first collection, 7 eighths, and comparison of that collection with the classic greedy algorithm. And then uh, I will also show in the same gra uh, plot a comparison uh, of the, um, of, of, of the uh, 0.93 subcollection with the results of the greedy algorithm. So as we see here, um, the horizontal axis it, it gives you the cardinality for the optimality problem, for the optim uh, optimization problem. And it varies from 2 to 41. 41 is the vertex cover. And the horizontal axis, say for a given value of k, the horizontal, uh, the, excuse me, the vertical uh, axis gives me the ratio for that value of k uh, for the greedy algorithm, f value for the offered solution of the greedy algorithm for k, 
uh, uh, divided by the F value for uh, our algorithm for that same value of K. And as I pointed out before, uh, we can prove that um, our algorithm is at least as good as the greedy algorithm, which means that this ratio is always greater than or equal to one. All right, so an, our algorithm produces an F value that's always smaller than that provided by the greedy, out, smaller than or equal to. So if you see here the uh, two graphs the, in the uh, diamond-shaped uh, uh, curve gives you the values for 7 eighths. Uh, the crosses give you uh, 0.93. And um, it, it is basically showing an improvement of the greedy algorithm um, uh, varying uh, up to 30% uh, depending on the value of K. Um, so what I've shown is that uh, uh, we've been able to uh, present an algorithm which is doing somewhat, well, in fact, not just somewhat, it gives, it's a good algorithm. It gives you uh, good offered solutions, optimal offered solutions, um, and works very well for uh, graphs um, up to about uh, 300. Three, uh, in other words, graphs with 300 vertices, and of course, Mathematically, of course, is, it, it should work for any value of n. Mathematically, we can show, yes, indeed, if you implement this algorithm, it will give an answer. But from a practical point of view, you do have to solve a linear equation. And although the matrix, matrices involved, the transition matrices are related to the Laplace matrix, all right, uh, and we know that the Laplace matrices, there are now very fast algorithms that are able to solve this, in, this problem. Uh, nevertheless, that said, it's still, we are still left with O of n squared, um, uh, we are left with O of n squared log n squared um, uh, computations. And for larger graphs, that's still uh, prohibitive. Um, so, can we come up with a way short of solving a linear equation that will allow us to, um, uh, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to basically uh, uh, solve the problem? Well, the I one idea is to look deeply into the theory of mixing Markov chains, and if you do that, I'll go back, it turns out that you can uh, express the first entrance time in terms of the bottleneck ratio. The bottleneck ratio of a, of a set in a, mark, in a irreducible reversible Markov chain is the ratio uh, of edges to the degree of, uh, to, to the sum of the degrees of the set. And given that, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll skip that and go to the um, uh, function, that arises from those considerations, we can define a sort of a surrogate function uh, for a set that is much easier to compute, um, much faster to compute, and ask the question, can I, if I have pretty good values, high values for S, S, identify F values, all right, that are going to be low and therefore uh, lead to sets that are effective spreaders. And the answer is provided, uh, uh, at least a promising answer is provided by this, uh, by this graph, namely uh, on the horizontal uh, uh, axis, I've given values of S for the first example, uh, where I'm looking at five element sets, uh, something north of 33,000 of them. Uh, but in fact, I'll just look at the S sets, which have pretty good values. If I rank the S values by percentile, I'll start at around 70.75 or higher. The vertical axis gives me for each set that has a pretty good S value, the F corresponding F values. And you'll notice from this graph that they are, uh, in this uh, case, 
really very good. Uh, they started around the 98th percentile, and so in other words, we're looking at uh, very good near optimal sets F, and um, and so um, that is the beginning was the beginning of a very new chapter in this problem, namely extending this search for effective spreaders to large networks with hundreds of thousands of nodes and one case where there were millions of nodes. But I can assure you at that stage, I was collaborating with someone, uh, Roldan Pozo um, at uh, NIST, who is uh, an expert in large graphs. And we worked together on uh, developing, um, uh, based on somewhat uh, different principles, still using a surrogate, but very different principles for uh, finding e effective spreaders in uh, social networks and lar other large complex networks. So with that, um, that's a chapter I can't talk about, but um, I do want to thank you very much for, um, for your attention and um, you know, I uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. And let me. trip up here. <laughs> so we have time for a, a few questions. Um, there are microphones um, in the middle of the room if you'd like to uh, approach one of them to ask your question. Yes. Could you, would you mind going to the microphone if you're able? I may have I may have misunderstood you, but I think you said you were surprised that a subset did not turn out to be a subset of a vertex cover. But was it, were those elements also in another vertex cover, not the I, vertex that's a cover very good, you started uh, that's with? That's a very good, yeah. And, and that, I, I, I can't rule that out. Uh, I, I, I can't rule out that, uh, that it could be a subset of another uh, vertex cover um, in that example. Uh, what I can say is that when I looked at smaller examples, so uh, let's say you have 13, a graph with 13 vertices, or uh, then in that case, you know, you could actually find all of the vertex covers, you know, if you have a small enough graph. And no, uh, you know, sometimes, well, let's put it this way, for graphs of that size, uh, it didn't always, that is, the optimal set was not of a subset of the vertex cover, of uh, any vertex cover, to your point. But I, I can't rule out, I can't rule out that in that example that there isn't one that I, you know, that I missed. Yeah. I'm going to ask a slightly different kind of question, but I'm going to start by saying a, a long delayed thank you to you. Many, many years ago, you came to one of my talks on something completely different. I was talking about quasi-continuous functions, and you took me aside at the end and you asked me a really interesting question about absolutely continuous invariant measures, which I had never heard of, and it turned into one of my favorite papers that I've written, and I totally owe this to you being awesome and helpful and great mentor wow. for me. So my question is going to ask if you can do something like that again. If there's a young person who's here in this room who's thinking about getting involved in this, in this area of graph theory, which I actually know nothing about, um, how would you recommend they start? Do you have a favorite problem that you would hand off to them? So. A uh, recommendation for a problem or for getting into the area of whichever uh, Markov you which, chains? Yes. Uh, okay. Well. And thank you again. Yes. Well, thank you very much for coming up, and, and I'd be happy to talk with you later. That's just great. Um, well, uh, for the area, uh, there are um, fortunately a lot of very good books in uh, Markov chains. There is a book by uh, Wilmer 
Perez is uh, and the third author I should remember. Uh, but it, it's essentially, I think it's published by the American Mathematical Society. And it's a book on, it's an elementary book on Markov chains and it, and in particular the mixing properties. And um, the, the, the second part of the book is uh, somewhat advanced. I don't know the level of the, of the hypothetical young person, but if they're an undergraduate, let's say, uh, maybe um, a sophomore or a junior, I think they could handle um, the first uh, few uh, chapters, the first, in particular, the first uh, seven chapters. It's a wonderful uh, introduction, I think, to Markov chains. Um, and it, it, it would make also a very nice, um, you know, um, a book for a reading course, for example as well as perhaps a course that, you know, can be taught. So that's what I would uh, recommend from the uh, reading perspective. And um, I would also really recommend any, uh, if uh, that uh, is of a mind to do that, if the young person is, to go into an REU that, where they're looking at problems in connection with uh, Markov chains. Um, the, um, I guess I'll stop there. I could go on, but. Thank you for that. Um, let's give Dr. Hunt um, another round of applause for a really great talk.